Yes, and a quick reintroduction of our guests this morning on the newsroom. To my extreme left, we have Dr. Sam Kamau. We have uh, also Kokyo Cheng and Reverend Mutinda Musimi, basically looking at gender-based violence. Now, before we took the break, we were looking at the fact that possibly when we are reporting some of these stories, we have a cultural barrier that we may have. And this is not to say that the media is trying to hide the stories, but the fact that those the storytellers, as it were, those who are possibly going through gender-based violence may want to keep it as a secret because of cultural issues and the fact that that might expose them. Reverend, you wanted to say something before you took the break. Yes, I, I want to say maybe we need to do a little more in uh, investigating these stories. Mm -hmm. The fact that people don't want to speak about them should not kill the story. Mm -hmm. We need to go ahead and try to find out what is it that uh, they don't want to say, why is it they don't want to say these stories? Because in most cases, people are prevailed upon mm -hmm. not to speak out. Somebody has been abused, maybe they are a minor. Mm -hmm. Who is going to speak out for that minor if they are prevailed upon, say, by the parents or the relatives? I think that is where the media needs to, to come in. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, this minor will keep quiet and the story will never be heard. In some cases, it is against women and culturally maybe they're not supposed to raise the alarm and therefore unless somebody speaks for them, we, we must be the voice of the voiceless. And that's, that's my argument here that something can still be done irrespective of the cultural barriers that might be there in speaking out about these stories. All right, Dr. Kamal. I was actually going to say that uh, exposing these stories or covering them more, it actually encourages other silent sufferers to actually come out and speak about uh, these issues. The other thing, of course, and uh, I think it was highlighted by that story, when women are portrayed as victims consistently, it reinforces the perception that women are weak and powerless. And in a sense, it could actually lead to more violence. So I think beyond informing, we also need to go towards educating the public. What are some of the underlying issues that bring about this violence? What are the risk factors? And what uh, can people do? Beyond that is also actually highlighting the work of institutions and organizations that are involved in trying to help. First, it's the survivors, but also trying to educate uh, the people, the perpetrators. Now, some stories we have seen, they have, uh, you know, focus on the victim. There are instances where you see the focus is on the perpetrator. Uh, and, and I think both sides still need to come out so that uh, once, in, in terms of educating the public, but the major problem is looking at these as short stories and isolated incidences, instead of looking at the patterns of violence and then look for ways of encouraging or at least creating that awareness and educating the public. All right, Koki, we also hopefully have moved from the point where it was viewed as a uh, uh, men abusing women problem. Mm -hmm. At least mm -hmm. now we have covered a bit more of men who have also gone through the violence, and hopefully that is helping them come out a little bit more. But have we done enough on that sector? And like Dr. Kamau says, there is the feeling still that women are the victims. I think... Uh, um we need to reflect more on the kind of frames that we use uh, when reporting these uh, stories. Because if we take um, um, the approach of looking at such issues from a human rights perspective and report them with that uh, human lens, it is uh, more appealing to write stories about people with the idea that they are being violated. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the frequent use of crime frames, when you're always referring to this particular incident from a criminal uh, perspective, the story always ends with the police doing something about it. Mm -hmm. And yet, the very criminal justice system is a very weak in dealing with issues that they are not familiar with, then there will be a challenge in the way people perceive the issues. The more you tell stories, of course, people are encouraged to come up. But secondly, the more you tell stories from a social justice perspective, where violations of your rights to be safe, to be secure, to associate, uh, will remove that stigma that comes along with reporting uh, these incidences from a victim point of view. All right. Reverend Musimi, you're a communications and ethics uh, um, um, lecturer at DASTA. And of course, there's the ethical mm -hmm. angle of this, or of what's happening. But as the media, there's also the communication that we're giving out there. Are we framing these stories the way we should so that, like uh, uh, Koki says, it's not just the criminal aspect that we look at, mm -hmm. there's the social. 
there is the possibly environmental, uh, because all these cases do not just happen uh, in isolation. There, there, there are areas you'll find they're more uh, prone to happen than others. I agree. Um, the media is doing a great job. I think, first of all, reporting these cases is creating that awareness, and that is great, because then, as um, Dr. Kamara said, it helps people to begin to come out and speak. Of course, there are a number of issues that I personally uh, take issue with. In this specific case about the Migori woman, I felt there were some areas that should not have been exposed, especially I, I would not get to the point of showing her face for me. I know it gives, it makes it credible, but here she is uh, living in a community where people know her, and I'm thinking it might just be better to show the injuries and not show her face. But besides that, I'm also thinking that when we are dealing with gender violence, the matter of privacy, the matter of confidentiality must not be taken lightly. It's true somebody might agree that I don't mind if you take footage of me, but as the media, do we educate them to know the levels to which this footage might affect them and may, in the future? Allow me to pose you there. The question mm. then would be what, what are the challenges or why would you be a little bit shy of showing or exposing their faces, yet they're willing to do that? You see, their willingness does not mean they understand everything it entails. Once they go on air, they cannot control what is going to happen. Correct. And so my big question is, do we have time to educate these people that when we you know, show your face on air, this and that might happen. People will know, people will talk, others might even rejoice, others might be sending messages to this person or telling them, you know, they deserved it, and that is going to hurt them emotionally. So that bit for me is a concern. Do we have time to educate people that this might happen to you once we show you? The fact that I say, yes, go on and take footage does not necessarily give me permission to go on and do that. Okay. I yeah. think okay. For, <laughs> with media, it's very clear. The code of ethics will yeah. uh, okay. guide us and specifically those who are blood are normally children and probably people who are in situations that could uh, warrant their security. Mm -hmm. I think what we should worry about as a society, not just as media, is once somebody exposes uh, this, be, I mean, becomes the main subject of this uh, issue, then what is the um, concerted effort by society per se to protect this person and others. Because without, uh, okay, I know that it's gory, and uh, of course the media should be able to warn us that this is something that you should you know, t you know, be careful to watch. But the bottom line is that, uh, guided by the code of ethics, it's the children who we might need to conceal. For example, I might uh, worry about the girl more than I might worry about the mother. Mm -hmm. But then again we are saying, uh, in order for this issue to capture the attention of people, and since the victim frame has been used, then it is almost uh, obvious that, yes, we could try to kind of uh, not focus so much on the person's uh, facial aspect, but the wounds. But then again, we need a face to tell the story. The power in Wende's story last year was more about seeing the those, the person per se, and the follow-up stories that came with her, you know, getting the assistance the, for the, the hands. And, mm -hmm. Yes. So for me, I think in journalism, it's clear that, you know, there is the code of ethics, what needs to be done. And I believe every journalist, before you take any footage, you must sensitize the person about what you do, especially if it is something that is of grievous uh, consequences there. All right, Dr. Kamal. I think the purpose of this story is this, first to make sure you do no harm as a general rule. Mm -hmm. So somebody should not be harmed as a result of the story that has been carried. And uh, uh, agreeing with him again is uh, even if somebody has given consent, it's important you explain to them because these are not experts in handling uh, the media that mm -hmm. there are certain unintended consequences that could come up. And, and especially uh, the repercussions after the story ends. After the story, especially in the societies where they live, there are 
places actually where you can be victimized because of speaking out, mm -hmm. further sensitivity of who are the perpetrators. So if it is somebody who is close to the family, then it becomes a bit of a challenge in that mm -hmm. sense. Yes, but we are not going to protect, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I feel that uh, perpetrators <coughs> take advantage of the institutions they are in to cover themselves. You, you just mentioned, for example, in Thika, somebody was a, was a reverend, or, you know, so the story yes. you're saying, yeah. somebody is hiding behind the church, mm. somebody is hiding behind maybe the police, mm. somebody is hiding behind the family, mm. and family is the institution where you should be most secure. Mm. So for me, I feel that. Uh, even in so trying to protect image mm -hmm. of the community, you mm -hmm. must focus on what the issue is and the impact of that on the lives of the person. Actually, talking about uh, you know the perpetrators and some of those behind, I'm even getting a message here of uh, uh, a lady who has gone through gender-based violence, and this is being perpetrated by a police officer. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we hide their faces, when we uh, keep that identity, are we also protecting them in a way? To what extent, especially if somebody is willing? to talk about it, uh, and we've explained the consequences. Reverend, do you think that keeping this story aside then somehow allows them to continue in that dark corner? I think for me, we need to have levels of follow-up in these stories, and um, which is an item I, I really want to raise here. We have some very good stories that create awareness that could, could um, be followed up, but Almost immediately, the story dies. And then after that, we don't know what happened. And I think that's possibly part of journalism that it needs to come out very strongly. Because then, the levels I'm talking about, if we are not just reporting it today, because mm -hmm. this is a social evil that it needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. If we report it today, we, we need to gauge the levels of the kind of reactions that we are receiving from the viewers, from those who have heard about the case, and also from the society back where the case has happened. And may, maybe if there are some denials, for example, hey, I never did this, possibly then if we talk to this person and they, are, they don't care if you show their face, then we can say, hey, here is the evidence of what happened in black and white. Because I think those levels, so to speak, the stairs, are, are important where we report it first. After that, we can do a follow-up. Should the offender refuse, then we can show everything and say, here is the victim. They can give their story. This is what happened to me. It's real. And so I don't think we are covering up. I just think we need to be very sensitive to the security of these people, their privacy, and the repercussions that might occur that after up. the report. All right, and I'll come to yeah. you, Koki. Maybe you mm -hmm. can answer on that as well. But before that, just a quick reminder that you're welcome to participate. The phone lines are now open, and you can call us and let us know if possibly the angles that you feel the media has not covered. Maybe you are in an environment where you have witnessed or have gone through gender-based violence and feel uh, that possibly if your story was told differently, then it would help. Because, like you mentioned, the point is not just to tell the story. Mm -hmm. It is to create uh, an environment where that can stop and also address and help some of those victims. Koki. Mm -hmm. um, basically, what comes to mind is, like he says, the, 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 the effort the journalist must undertake to have source variation. I think that's important. And again, when you're talking about uh, balance, you want to make sure that you have the other person you know, give their side of story, and you also want to make sure that you have uh, important reports from different perspectives. It might be critical not to just give uh, a one-sided account, uh, because this is the person who has faced that challenge. And that way then, because you have uh, you know, looked at different sources, and also changed the motive of the um, frame from being uh, Conflict, because when when you say, when you do he said, he uh, she, she said, said. Mm -hmm. of course, then it leaves out what was the mathematics in between. Mm -hmm. So it's important that uh, when we tell the stories in the follow-up stories that we really seek to understand uh, the perpetrator, where the perpetrators seem to be coming from, or the environment, mm -hmm. or again, what would be the circumstance under which this person suffered. 
uh, that fit. Mm -hmm. So I think from that perspective, then it will give the audiences a broad understanding of uh, circumstances that would lead to them being in those positions. All right, Dr. Kamau, moving forward, what is it that you possibly would want to see in the stories that we cover now uh, when it comes to gender-based violence? They seem to have uh, a template. And when I say a template, here's the victim, this is what happened, and we are all left feeling very sorry for them. Could we change that so that we have more impact? I think one of the things is expanding the sources talking also to the law enforcement uh, agencies, the magistrates and all that, so that people get to understand the law. It's important at times you link the consequences of the actions that people are taking. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, right. Um, yeah, go on. So I, 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 ask, I, I agree with the Dr. Sam here, because uh, at the end of the day, uh, when we tell stories holistically from, like I said, the right-based perspective, you are giving people an understanding of whatever is happening that seems normal because uh, gender-based violence is normalized in society. So when we, we, we try to remove that normality by telling that story from uh, a social perspective, uh -huh. then it makes people more literate on how to handle such an issue or even just engage with them, I mean, how they will, you know, behave within an environment where they should feel safe. Mm -hmm. The idea of your safety as a person should be uh, something the media teaches people to do. Mm -hmm. You should be able to see the red flags, you should be able to understand that uh, if you find yourself in that environment, how best do you remove yourself from that environment? All right. So, yeah. And uh, I'm going to take a few calls before I come to you. We have okay. Nelly Oseko <coughs> from Kisi. Good morning, Nelly. And uh, you can give, uh, Wesley, sorry, Wesley Oseko, uh, give us your comment or question. Uh, okay, um, I'm making a comment. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I've just followed uh, your conversation on uh, the role of the media. Mm -hmm. And uh, I strongly believe that the media indeed has a role to play in exposing these, uh, you know, atrocities to uh, both gender, either uh, women or men. And um, honestly, um, uh, hearing uh, what the panelists are saying, um, uh, especially on uh, 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 concealing or protecting the identity of the, especially uh, those who perpetrate the violence, mm -hmm. I tend to feel that, uh, like you said, um, uh, uh, like you said, uh, on um, really when we protect them, I tend to feel that is uh, going a long way in, uh, you know, kind of promoting that particular act. Okay. I feel that, uh, yeah, you know, the person who has gone to the extent of, uh, you know, perpetrating such a particular act honestly loses that moral, uh, you know, element of uh, privacy or being covered, he does not, he or she does not deserve in any way uh, to be concealed from the public. The public should know who this person is, and in any way it will help the public or whoever or anybody else to keep away from such a person because... Any, I mean, there's another person who is likely to be the next victim. Right. So I strongly feel, if anything, whoever who should be protected, therefore, should be the case, for example, of the girl who we saw somewhere in Kuri Omgori. The girl, uh, maybe she doesn't know, she's young, she can be enlightened, as you have said. All right. Okay, but Wesley, I think... I th should be should not be protected. Thank you, Wesley. I think we get your point. Let's take uh, Duncan Mugire from Mombasa. Good morning, Duncan. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. Go right ahead to your comment or question. Uh, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> My comment is uh, gender-based violence, uh, uh, it, it's rife in the community. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's all over the world. Okay. Uh, but I think a lot has to be done uh, by society because it's, not only in the middle income manners, the, you know, the low income manners, it's there all over. So we need to, uh, to address uh, the psychological needs uh -huh. and the NGOs uh, that, 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 I, that I think exist, they are not doing enough 
to do because it's 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 a real issue. That's okay. That's my comment. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Duncan. And let me come back to the panel. Uh, start with you, Reverend. On uh, well, there is that issue of protecting uh, people. But before we also went to the calls, there was the question of uh, mm -hmm. what we need to do and possibly how we can restructure this story so that we have more impact rather than just having a story that hangs just there. I must say the impact is already great, but we can have more. I think I'll mention three things. One of them, literacy, people need to learn that they can speak out. Mm. And the media has a role to play in that. I would wish to see much more follow-up. I think, to me, this is a pertinent issue. I've already mentioned it. Follow-up on the cases that have already been highlighted. And thirdly, advocacy on um, who takes care of the financial aspect for the victims. We report, is it possible that through the media we can advocate for a fund that helps in treating such people for free without having them to pay? Because when you're taken to hospital, you have to foot the bills. Those, for me, are real issues that need to be addressed. Okay. Yep. Uh, uh, just uh, to follow up with the funds, I think there are already government institutions that mm -hmm. really talk, I mean, deal with them. We have the National Gender um, the National Gender NGEC, and we have the Gender Recovery Center, which has stories are told, many stories are told. If you follow up what kind of work they are doing, uh, organizations like COVAC, uh, I'm weak. They have stories untold, mm. which we can use in terms of resources, mm. just to be able to understand the extent to which uh, this vice is happening. Mm. I like the comment that uh, Duncan from Mombasa made. He says that it's universal. But what we are saying, since it's a universal issue, then it must be looked at you know, yeah, as a right-based mm. issue. Mm. And the, the more we look at our reporting, from a specialized point of view and push agenda through media advocacy where we are saying as media, we are taking up uh, GVB, KTN, mm -hmm. and these are the stories we'll run in a series. Just the way you do with politics, 100 days of politics, you could probably <laughs> we can do, do GBV, yes. which I think we've done, especially when there is that campaign, the, the, the campaigns going on. Uh, Reverend, in terms of uh, communicating and churning out students who, or rather journalists, who are able to, should we be looking at also specializing maybe on social issues? Mm -hmm. we, yes. tend to, we tend to tend to specialize on things like politics, mm -hmm. uh, maybe terror, but we leave out the family. I think I need to begin here with the training. There are already universities that are offering such training where people can learn how to report gender-based violence. That's where it begins. And even those that have not gone through that training, I think it's basically just a paradigm shift on the kind of reporting that they do. They can easily pick up this and begin to report on these matters. It is for all of us. The society is suffering, and I'm sure even the journalists themselves come from families where there might be untold stories. Absolutely. And some of them cannot report these stories because, again, culturally, they have not been set free. And mm. therefore, even when they look at these stories, the way they report them, they are seeing them through their cultural background, which does not allow them to speak out, especially, say, if a man is hurting because his wife is beating him. Mm. So I think there's a kind of freedom that we, we need to have so that we can freely report these stories. OK. Yeah. yeah. Talking, think... uh, concentrating now also mm. on the non-physical violence, because there's mm. a lot of that going on. But the physical uh, has more visual you know, uh, attributes that we can use. But the psychological sometimes is very heated. Mm -hmm. is, are, the, are those stories that possibly should also be exploring? Because like you mentioned in your opening statement, mm -hmm. by the time somebody chops off your hands, that story is not beginning from the chopping off of hands. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just before I go into that, I would like to talk about the training element of it. I'm sure um, it has been apparent in the communication and media space in education that uh, specialized training, for example, in gender reporting, business reporting, political reporting is part of the curriculum. Mm. And of course, um, I can tell you, I'm teaching a gender class, a gender reporting class, and to my surprise, nobody knows what gender is. They think it's sex. So you can imagine uh, the importance of having that specialized training in the institution. Now, with emotional abuse, you will not know whether you're being emotionally abused until you're made aware. So I think 
the literacy aspect of it needs or to be highlighted. Needs to be highlighted mm -hmm. because you have been socialized to see for example, that your, your sisters or siblings or cousins are, are married by 14, what will make you think that that is out of the norm? So I think what media should do in that uh, 100 days of media advocacy I'm proposing on GVB is to talk about what are those triggers? What are the flags? What are the issues uh, that lead to uh, gender-based violence? What is an indicator that you're being emotionally abused? And how does that then translate quickly to physical uh, abuse, mm -hmm. starting from a slap right to cutting your, off your limbs? Mm -hmm. So those are educational issues that uh, media can take up, take up. And uh, craft, uh, use the right genres to be able to explain them, because these are human features, human uh, feature stories. Mm -hmm. But then again, you can have a talk show with people who come and explain uh, from an, a different uh, angles, angles mm -hmm. and give uh, their, you know, their expertise so that somebody can have a composite understanding of what emotional abuse is. All right, and uh, maybe your closing comments, Reverend? I would say maybe you need to open up for victims mm -hmm. to come and speak, and possibly those that are considered as perpetrators, maybe as we follow up these cases and somebody is thrown into jail, suppose one day we brought them here, hey, why did you cut off your wife's hands? Maybe they can give us the story behind the story and we begin to understand because look at our society. Even mob justice, if we met that person, chances are people would just stone him and burn him. They don't want to know the story. And I think we insist that story that people do not know, which mm -hmm. triggered this, needs to be known. Needs to be told. Yeah. All right, we are